Hello and welcome to Sensei Podcast. This is Manos Brilakis discussing with leaders in the field of CTO and Complex PCI. Sensei means teacher or master in Japanese. The goal of the Sensei Podcast is to help you learn and improve in CTO and Complex PCI so that you can become the best that you can be and offer your patients the best possible results. Hello and welcome to Sensei Podcast. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce our guest today, who is Dr. Stefan Harb from the University of Graz in Austria, an outstanding CTO operator and educator. And more importantly, he's coming with us today, although he's on vacation in Hawaii. So so is his commitment to the field. Thank you so much again, Stefan. It's a great pleasure uh, to talk to you this morning. And thanks for getting up so early in Hawaii. Hi, Manos. It was no problem to get up early. And I got full permission of my for, from my wife that I will have an hour with you today. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And actually, let's go straight to the uh, to the point. And I know that you've built a great CTO program. You've been involved in this for a long time. So tell us a little bit. How was uh, how, how did the things come for you? How did you get involved in CTO and complex PCI? How did you learn? Um, what are the key influences you've had in your career? You know. My career, if it's a career at all, Manos, it was very slow and is still ongoing. So uh, maybe I start out with the fact that I wasn't even supposed to be in interventional cardiology. I was like in intensive care very early. And uh, I was invited someday uh, just to see another intensive care unit in Germany. And there I got in touch with Detlef Jäger, who was an interventional cardiologist. And uh, the situation in Graz was like that. You know, we had this university hospital, and in the same building, we had like a provincial hospital just in the same hospital. And it was a little bit of a competi competitive situation between the two. Uh, so we were very early with the echo. We had an echo before the university had the echo, and they didn't believe in what you can see in an echo. Uh, and, they, and the other thing would be like they had just one guy who would do. Uh, one guy who would do interventional cardiology for a long, long time together with his boss. Uh, and the one guy was actually coming from Estland uh, at a time when Estland was still Russian. And they managed to have a program. Uh, he was actually a heart surgeon who had built a program for interventional cardiology in Estland. We're talking about 1990, you know, it was really early. And that guy had a dream. He wanted to be, for just at one, one time in his life, he wanted to be in the United States. So he was applying for scholarship. But he was unlucky. He said he was too red, as he put it. So he was only granted a scholarship for Austria. And that this guy, who was already skilled in interventions, was sitting behind his boss, who had come from Duke University, I think it was. Uh, not from Duke as a faculty, but he was an Austrian who was educated for a short time in Duke to get this interventional program in Graz University started. And now he had the scholarship person sitting behind him and finally finding out this guy can do more than I can. And the two then established the, the program, the interventional program, in the University of Graz. But I was unlucky. I was at the other hospital in the same building. And we were only uh, supposed to do diagnostic angio. You can imagine just doing a diagnostic angio in a, what we call now non-STEMI and not being able to put a stand and sending that person back to the out, out of Graz hospital and have him come back for intervention to the university later. It was really a strange situation. And so this is how I got started. You know, I got started in a situation I wasn't supposed to be in interventional cardiology. Well, but despite that, you made uh, you made a lot of progress and you did a great work. So how did you able to change that condition and, you know, learn it and become very good at it? Yeah, this was only possible by many, many mentors and helpers and great people like you also uh, who helped me. You know, when you're situ situated in this small pond and you have this little bit larger pond next to you, which was the university, then you tend to look out for other ponds or maybe even the sea or the ocean, like I'm sit having behind me now the Pacific for the first time in my life, you know, in, in the middle of the Pacific, really a wealth of fish, you know. 
and I'm just one little fish in that in this pond, in this very large pond. So what I was doing, I was setting out uh, to other people. I, I was trying to get inter interac interaction with other people outside of Graz because I was approaching the university, asking that boss, can't you tr uh, just teach me how to do BCI? Because I would so much like to do that, like the, the, this guy from Estland does it. It was Olaf Luha from Estland, who is already retired now. I wanted to put one stand in my life just to be happy, you know, because I, for some reason it was a dream. I don't can't really tell why. But Detlef Jäger was the other guy, and this is also has something to do with my wife, because uh, I went to that intensive care unit in Bochum just to see that. It was invited by a company, and the intensive care was not so different from my intensive care at home, so this was not so exciting. But that guy, Detlef Jäger, he took me to his cat lab and he actually did great work. And for, at that time, uh, Bergmanns Heil Bochum was a really special, small but very special hospital in Europe. They, did, uh, they started out very early after the, uh, the, when, when Dudek did the studies in Poland. They very early did this networking with, for the STEMI and they didn't do lytic therapy anymore. So I came home uh, with a dream. I wanted to be the Catholic the more, you know. And uh, then what has to do with my wife? There was another conference in Southern Tyrol. Uh, Tyrol and there I sat uh, together with uh, Detlef and his wife and me and my wife. And we had wine. And I was asking him, can't you teach me PCI like in the summer? And he you also had some wine. I'm well, not sure you can come, but I, I don't think he would really have figured that I could actually come, you know. And but I did, <laughs> <laughs> I did come. So no insurance. It was 1997, very late in my life already. No, uh, no insurance, no uh, formal uh, edu education in PCI whatsoever before that. And I was spending the vacation summer not at the Mediterranean, but in Bochum, Germany. And my wife was accepting that. She was coming with the kids for some time. She went to the Mediterranean by herself with the kids and came back and stuff. And I did just 100 PCI uh, during the summer because Detlef would help, help me, let me do his cases and just help me with it. And this was the start, you know. And that was uh, like two years back home. My boss was not really so amused because he was in echo more than in interventions. He would have been, and then we had the situation, I could have had the chance to join University of Graz when a new hospital was built in Graz. We were supposed to be disengaged from university. We were put to the other side of town. So I had the chance to see the birth of a new hospital or stay at a place that maybe join university. But at that time, I figured it would be more exciting to see the birth of the hospital. And I talked my boss into let's just do PCI and he finally after like there was a situation where it couldn't uh, order anything I couldn't order stents or balloons or anything but he would say like at this date you can do your first patient so I had to borrow all kinds of material from different companies and then the date was arriving and it was said no not this year next year so I was getting used, maybe this was necessary to make me a better CTO operator to really have these obstacles you know Maybe you want to ask something in between. But yeah, but what I'm impressed is that, you know, you say it was very difficult, you know, for many of us who go to a fellowship, they go, I mean, it's much more simple for you. You had to jump all these hoops, essentially, had jump all these obstacles, as you say, to make it work, which I guess speaks volumes, first of all, to your commitment to the area and uh, to the, the, the point that if you really want something, no one can keep it from you, but you're going to get it. So what kept you? you know, trying and pushing and keeping on going and trying to get that. Yeah, this is, I think this is something in, inborn. This must be some pioneer gene because as when I do something new, I tend to be very curious, no matter what field it is, needn't be medicine, whatever it is. I want to figure it out. I want to see what is behind it. I just want to know about the world. If if it's fish, if it's whatever, I don't care. You know, uh, and today it's very easy. You just get, they get your iPhone, you t just Google something. My sons are very uh, tough on me on this. Like I have two sons, they're grown up, grown up now. And the younger one is in internet security. And when I'm asking something for how to work the computer, so he says, why don't you Google it, you know? 
Uh, he wouldn't, <laughs> <laughs> and, and he made me get into this field more. So this is uh, just an example that uh, my, my, I'm very proud of my sons actually because they are not in medicine; they are doing their thing. You know, they they, had, they are not impressed by what my father does. Like I was also not uh, supposed to be in medicine. My father is a farmer, a very wholehearted farmer. It was the only thing he could imagine to do, except for maybe being a cook on a ship. And when he was very young, he had the chance to get on the ship to be a cook, but that was not coming into reality as his father died and he had to take the farm. So he was really into farming. So I started out without having a doctor in my family. And my kids start out without, uh, not in medicine, for sure, because this is Papa's business. You know, it's very interesting. <laughs> but but this pioneer gene to do something new seems to be in the family. So it is some genetics to it, which I guess we cannot do much about it. But you kept on pushing for it. So you kept on asking. And eventually, uh, when did you actually start doing the PCIs? And when you start doing the CTO PCIs? I started doing the PCIs like Bochum, Germany. Then I did some PCIs in Vienna just to make sure that somebody would help me as I was starting my own PCI program in a hospital that didn't have a PCI program. So to have some backup in the country, if there is some problems that somebody would speak up and say, yes, the guy can do it. He's not super crazy. He's, he has worked on it before and stuff. And then uh, came part one by one, you know, at that time, like before 2000, just in the last, ten, last millennium, uh, at the end of the millennium, rotor was not uh, really popular, rotablation. But for some reason, I met, some, I had some difficulties with calcified arteries, and I thought rotor is the only logical thing to do. And I didn't ask, I couldn't ask my boss because he said, "Don't do rotor, because this is patients that are complicated, difficult. It will uh, our, our numbers will be different." And so I went to Vienna to have my first mentor in rotor, rotablation. And this is very uh, important for my so-called career because uh, at that place, it was a very small hospital in Vienna. This was the only guy in Austria that really did rotoblation, a lot of it. And I would like have my patients come with me to Vienna and he allowed me to do the rotor and he would help me. For 10 years, you couldn't imagine, for 10 years I was doing that before finally I had a patient I could, had, could not be transported because he was in such a bad shape. So I did my first rotor at home in a very exciting patient. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, uh, well, during those ten, those 10 years were not spent in vain. These were 10 years where I got in touch with first uh, Masahisa Yamani. He was like coming to Austria doing cases in that small hospital. So I was allowed to observe a, a really good CTO work from Masahisa. It was like enlightenment for me seeing this guy work. I mean, I'm still a, a friend of him. I'm, I'm, so, I'm admiring him. It's, it's just a very special person if you see the whole globe. He's ex so super excellent and so special and so open to Western world. And so, so he's a man who can build bridges. And, you know, he is uh, one, maybe the most important mentor. But I also met uh, George Cianos there. And like 2009, George would do knuckling, you know. And I was not really into this field too much at that time. I said, hey, what are you doing? Are you messing up? What are you doing? You, you're damaging the vessel. And I said, no, no, this is just a new technique. So this was how I got in touch with knuckling. And it was impressive how the, he did it. I mean, it was, it was really great. And I think the... Uh, most important other CTO operator is was is my close friend Kambis Mashayeki. Kambis is uh, born in the same province. We were together. Uh, he is a lot younger than me. I was like the grandfather of the paramedics when he started to be a paramedic in the, with the Red Cross in Graz. And this was where we got in touch. And then Kambis had also a, a tough time to get started because in Graz, you know, it was not so popular to do to have another guy do PCI. <laughs> so he actually had to go to Germany and had to do autodidactically, just get together all this knowledge and just start out doing CTO in a very small private hospital. But Kambis was helping me a lot because uh, like he was coming to Graz, uh, proctoring me, helping me do patients 
first just in a private setting, like in the hospital, no spectators. But very soon we decided, to, why not do these exciting cases and have uh, other uh, uh, colleagues come and uh, observe us and participate. And so in this super small hospital that wasn't even supposed to have a, a PCI program, we had the first conferences in class for CTO PCI. I mean, this was campus naturally. And what I was contributing was, uh, I had the trouble with femoral bleeding once. So with femoral bleeding, I actually lost the patient. This was like 2004 or so, rather late for the radial area, but for Austria, it was early. Austria was not radial back then. So I visited Ferdinand Kimini, who became a friend by that also. I'm still in touch, even though he's retired now. He's a very good friend also. Or Marshal Amon, who at that time wanted to have radial access to be a 1A indication. You know, it, it, I really experienced how a guy stood up, a small, just a, a guy from France, from the Normandy. He said, I'm going to work on that. Radial will be 1A indication. He said that like 2005 or so. And I had him come to Austria for a conference. So to get this Radial Austria program started, together with a guy with Thomas Brunner from Vienna, the two of us, really thought this would be the thing to do. And so we did it. And uh, in my hospital, I'd, I have been doing it for six years as the only guy. Everybody else was just looking on. Maybe somebody will have a problem with the arm and so. And uh, But then, then everybody switched. But it took a long, long time to, to accept this. And the same is true for CTO PCI. Uh, you said I have a great program. Well, I have great dreams. I'm still uh, in my hospital. I had conferences on that and everything, but not near as uh, much space. I, I, the program is not at the point where I want it to be. And uh, three years ago, I was invited by University of Graz to build the program at the university. So at the very old age, I was invited to go to the university. So now my task is to really get this started in a way that I can be proud of it finally when I retire. Well, but again, it looks like one builds another, right? You were starting the complex, you do the rotablation, then you do the CTOs, then you do the radial. So you keep on pushing the and learning more and getting better in many areas. So this is not just one area, but multiple, multiple areas. And you met great, many great people. But when it came to actually doing it, how do you go from you know, watching people and starting to do it by yourself without having support from other people. What were the things that helped you go to this transition phase? You know, I think CTO PCI is very much in the head. And this is where you come in also with your your collection. You, you collect all the f facts and the tricks and the tips in your great books. You know, you're working hard on that, getting this from everywhere, having the input from everywhere. And this is where, like, as I said already, Cambis comes in. And this is where like people like Bill Lombardi come in. Like uh, I would participate in webinars that would be not be at six in the morning, but like in two in the morning at Austrian time. Uh, where Paul Tierstein was participating and uh, Mike Wyman and also Bill Lombardi. And after one of those uh, webinars, Bill would just drop me an email and say, oh, I have the feeling you you want to improve. You, How can I help you? You know, this was also very exciting. It's all, also always like that. It's and, and I have, I'm very much in, in, uh, indebted also to the British Society of Cardiology, not the society, but the people who are the society. The, there's Mamas Mamas, there is uh, uh, Nick Curson, there is Mohamed Egret, I don't know, uh, many, 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 many. I cannot name them all, but they let me participate like in Manchester in a Transradial Masterclass and later CCI Live in Newcastle. So what I am alluding to, I am doing this in my brain. I am collecting all this in my brain. I have a lot of theoretical uh, knowledge and my uh, my CTO program, part of it still is unfortunately in my brain, but now I have the chance to uh, to spread the news more than ever before to like fellows like Alex Achim, who was my first fellow at the university three years ago. He was doing his first steps in really good uh, CTO PCI and stuff. And I just added what I could at that time. And now he is together with Gregor Leibungut really doing great stuff, doing science, doing better CTO PCI than I can do. Uh, you know, I'm just a, a, 
like a, a small part of the system. And, and I think my main uh, role is to interact with many, like also like Japanese uh, Slender Club or the Korean uh, Trans Radio Society. This is was all things like uh, a person to person thing, not a, not a program to program or a you know, uh, organization to organization thing. So I actually I, I have not done, have made any career as you alluded to. But I am this networker, and so I have this input from somewhere. I look for some input actively. If I, something is missing, then I try to get things together. And I enjoy a lot that I am just the one that has the shoulders where my fellows can stand on and maybe build it. Well, obviously, very try, try, you know, very humble and try to keep things down. And what I mean, impresses me is that you have a lot of knowledge, a lot of skills. You build things through a lot of obstacles. But the the question that many people want to know is how do you organize all these things? Because you show in many different areas and you organize them in such a way that you can actually use them when you need something, either for ADL or CTO for anything. So how do you organize them in your in your head and become uh, an expert on this area? In my head, it's completely clear. In reality, it's chaotic. It's, you know, you know, it's like, like the beginning of PCI in my hospital. I have to get a present from this company to just this, uh, use this tool, for instance, I say, I cannot pay for it. Can I try? As I'm Stefan, they let me try. The next time we might order that, if it's a good thing. You know, it's completely chaotic. I had a little bit more of a system in my, uh, in my hospital, in my small hospital, because after a while, people accept, okay, that guy can get this open and stuff, and that they would accept that. But now at the university, it's a little bit different. I have a great partner. I have Gabor Todd. I don't know if you know Gabor. He's a brilliant scientist. And this is all uh, here I am together with in a bit, little bit larger bond with very many people who have a lot in their brain. So it's constant learning every day and constant uh, rearranging what I'm actually thinking and aiming at because uh, switching the scenery and really going to some other place it makes you a different person. It, you have to reevaluate what is what am I going for? What do I want to do? You have to argue. Why do you do this? And the other hospital, they accept it. Okay, I, we, we're not interested how he does it, but how, the main thing is he gets it open. Uh, so, so the teamwork is actually for me is now uh, more than ever coming up. Uh, uh, so that I'm supposed to be the mentor. I'm supposed to be. The humble one, yes, this is my role. This is what is the best way to do it, to approach, me, be it the, RT, the radio technician or the nurse. You know, it's not only the doctor to doctor thing to make uh, CTO PCI be accepted, which is still isn't in the way I want it to be accepted. You really have to get everybody on this boat. And so it's, it's I can only like today I talk to you the other day I have that uh, maybe the radio technician that's interested in it or the other radio tech that says, oh, this whole thing was for nothing because we didn't get it open. So they would clearly tell it to me, you know. So I have to really defend this uh, a little bit. And uh, on the other hand, it is worthwhile because uh, especially the critics, like three years ago, the, everybody would say CTO, oh, that takes a long time. It's a lot more fun to do the ECMO thing. It's more dramatic, you know, rather have a person come in with only one open artery and this is a critical one, last vessel, and we do uh, impeller and this is fun thing to do, even though the outcome might be a lot worse. But but this is so spectacular. This is what people like. And there they have their role, like in in battle in war. You know, CTO is a little bit different. It's more about planning, more about patience. Not so spectacular. <laughs> not so much of a difference on the table. Maybe the pa patient says, "Okay, I can breathe in better better now." But usually the facts come out later when my personnel doesn't see the patient anymore. So I have to do that feedback also to get them find out what's, what this is doing to the patient in a positive way. And then, uh, Stefan, in terms of um, the cases that like you've done enough and you, you've done techniques, do you get, how do you plan for those cases? Do you um, look at the angiograms? How much time do you spend? How, how, how is your planning process right now for CTOs? Uh, my planning process is in a way that I really have to think through the angio by myself, uh, in, in just in private, 
then I discuss it with somebody. Then I have it, now I have the chance to, to have a younger guy on the board who is taking this, who is going to really uh, carry this on. And I, we talk about it together. We make our plans. I have a fellow say, what would you do? I listen to that. So I, we, I discuss mm -hmm. it before I go to the patient. Then there is another thing I took from the other hospital I had worked in. I had a colleague there who was very much in CT, in coronary CT. So uh, in my small hospital, I had the possibility to see the CT in 3D on screen when I entered the cath lab routinely, not only for CT or PCI. And I'm not just building that at the university now, which you couldn't imagine there would be obstacles. You know, you think it's the most natural thing to have. If you have, everybody has a CT, why not have the information, not only in the report, but why not have the pictures on screen before you go to the cat table? And this is actually my task this year to get this in a good way. It, it, it's not easy, you know. <laughs> they say, we never did this, we don't need it, we, uh, we can do without, we can, they don't uh, acknowledge at this time what a joy it is to see the vessel before you actually open it. So... I mean, the, this is also part of the planning that I do really meticulously look at the information that is there, not let all the angios, not just last year's angio, maybe the angio 10 years ago. <laughs> Actually, one patient had a, a closed C, uh, RCA for 25 years because they thought at that time that it wouldn't be worth to be bypassed. And then he would always have angina, but they'd say, oh, no, this is not a problem. The, L, the L, LED is okay. You have this edema. Uh, so you will survive, which he did. But he always had this strange feeling. And 25 years later, I, I opened his RC. But it was only possible because I looked at all the all the angios before, even the very old angio. And because I I have to name another mentor, one of the many. I'm not able to name all of them. But one of the most important maybe is Achim Büttner. So in that case, I just discussed the angio with Achim. And he'd say, oh, could take this epicardial. And so I would not even have to dare to do the epicardial. But he showed me how it would work and which one would be the best. And then with, without him at the table, just with his knowledge in the back of my mind, I did the case and was successful. Wonderful. So again, that's a great thing to discuss and talk about to the people. I mean, communication always helps both before, but also during the case when things uh, may not go the way that we're planning. Do you get nervous? Like when you do your procedures, do you get nervous, anxious? How do you feel when you do the cases? I get excited. I'm looking forward to the case. Uh, sometimes not so much when I'm not having a plan in my head, but then usually I don't start the case. I, I start the case with a plan or not or with several plans in my head. Uh, so if I cannot imagine a good outcome, I tend to not do the case at this time, maybe t talk to somebody else before, because uh, 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 it is something in the head. I think I see this a lot with Cambis. If I watch Cambis working, he's working uh, on a vessel where I cannot imagine what would be the outcome, but he in his head sees it already. It's like a sculptor knows how to, what to put away and what will be, what will stay, you know? So he will work with the wires in a quick way and I would have a hard time watching what he's actually doing. And then finally, the vessel would be created, a, a peripheral, uh, a crux of the RCA that nobody could imagine how it would look like if it was not for the CT, maybe, which often is not looked at. But uh, so if I have a plan, if I, if I have the feeling this will work, then I need another ingredient. <clears throat> the other ingredient would be I need a, a strong bonding with the patient. So when I started this program at university, I was the first thing I was asking for was I want to see the patient before I have him on the table. I want to have like an outpatient clinic uh, just to uh, get in touch with the patient. The better if the partner of the patient is there or maybe the kids are coming also so we can talk it through. I can show what, we, what our plans are. By that, I also see how much risk does this patient want to uh, have to to accept uh, to to get what you know if there is no dyspnea if there is no angina if it's just a scintigraphy or something that is pointing at ischemia I might turn down a case <clears throat> if the patient is feeling well even though in our community everybody would do it but uh, as men I have to take a sip. <clears throat> 
as many patients are not treated in Graz, I have the situation that I still choose the better, the better cases. And I want to do the cases that are beneficial for the patient. Perfect. So that's very unique. And again, it's a different level when you understand exactly what the patient wants and needs and what are the limitations and the pluses and benefits. Now, um, are there any cases that have stuck with you that you taught you a lot, uh, good or bad ones over the years? Yes. <clears throat> I had uh, one extremely bad case that was not a CTO case. This was actually a case, just a regular angio. It was a person who wanted to come to me, wanted to have it done radial at the early stage. And I could not, it was a, a very uh, interesting situation and I suffered a lot at, the, at that time because this, it, this was actually a colleague. And the colleague, uh, before that, a year before that, he came to me with 42 degree Celsius body temperature. Nobody knew why. So he had some infectious problem. Some, somehow we solved that. I have no idea what it actually was. Uh, so it, we had that situation like when I was doing uh, the cooling, the cooling would not start because it was above the temperature that was supposed to be. You know, the mm -hmm. American rules, if it's above 42, you have to trick it out so that uh, you can even use it. Uh, so, so it was a very interesting situation where, where I had a patient that survived in my hands without I uh, really doing something reasonable except for cooling and doing the regular stuff. I never understood the situation, but he survived. And a friend of his was uh, also a patient of mine, <clears throat> and I did a good job in that patient. So uh, when for some, let's say, not, not even good indication, this patient that had survived a strange situation came to me for angio, the indication was like there was a little bit of troponin during this strange disease, which is not really... Today we would know that this is not of no meaning whatsoever uh, co uh, what the, concerning the heart. We would not really do the angio. But at that time we valued uh, troponin very high. We said troponin was early time of troponin. was like uh, 50, 10 years ago or 15 years ago even. And then we, it, everybody thought it would be an indication to make sure he even had a magnetic resonance uh, stress mm -hmm. echo then. And this did show, he, he, the guy even had a party going on because the doctor was telling him, no, there is nothing on your MR. But the other day he would call him and say, oh, we did see something. So make sure and have this angio done. And then mm -hmm. he elected me to do the angio because he wanted to do it, have it radial. And I had a heart attack. He was a very obese person, and uh, we talked a lot while we were doing the thing. And I was, was doing it radially. It was not easy to access. There was subclavian tortuosity. So I had to use a SAHI system, this sheathless system, just to get to the heart. And what I didn't know at the time, because it was already loaded on the sheath, uh, I used a long tip uh, for the left, the long tip J, uh, JL uh, Chatkin's curve for the left, and that really jumped to his left main and uh, obstruct, obstructed, dissected the left main. And at that time, I did not have the skill to really open up the vessel, so I had to go directly to surgery, and he did not survive. He did not survive. It was really, I suffered a lot. I tell you, this is a situation, uh, if it would have been maybe early in my career, I would have quit because it was so really terrible. It was, but what came out of it, in my, it, and it was many times in my life like that, that there was something I did mess up with it wrong. You know, from that time on, I I think I was the most careful interventionist the year after, and I would any time I would just diagnostically approach the left main, I would do it in a super careful way. And I still am very careful at this step. I, I never do it roughly anymore. And I also have to, this was also an incentive to learn how to get something open that is closed down in a way that you cannot easily open it. So mm -hmm. uh, I developed, a, or I found that others had tried to put a microcatheter there to do the, get it to the false lumen, put it on suction, put the word course wire around it, just a simple technique that is very helpful in such a situation. Or like Cambis would have taught, taught me, go, just go retrograde in a case like that. But for that, you have to acquire special skills. So a very bad experience, which made me suffer a lot. 
uh, really made me very enthusiastic about finding out ways how what to do in a case like that. And this was almost a direct road uh, to the CTO PCI. Not, not so direct that I would be in a fellowship program, but whenever I heard anything about situation like that, I would pick it up and really put it in the back of my mind to have it ready. And then when it comes to um, doing those cases, now that you've done them, you teach people, you do the fellows and everyone else, um, what do you find the hardest thing to teach when you have new operators and new fellows learning this procedure? Yeah, I think this example that I just put right now, if I watch fellows the first day, I'm so concerned. Hopefully they don't mess up the left mate. So I really have to breathe a little bit So okay, because you have to have them do it. And okay, now I know how to fix it. So it's easier. Uh, but uh, these are the things I... Uh, sometimes I'm over-concerned, maybe to... Uh, maybe a burden on the young fellow that he will say, well, I haven't done anything wrong yet, so what are you concerned about? <laughs> but uh, this is a, a also very tough for me. I have to learn this. I have to work on that to let go and still be helpful. So, <clears throat> And uh, maybe there is another situation that uh, fits this. Uh, not so long ago, it was already on the university, so it was within the last three years, we had a daycare patient come. And daycare patients uh, usually are not in a bad shape. They're in a good shape. This is where they are having this in a daycare setting. It's not quite true anymore because we don't have this in-hospital setting anymore available for patients. So we do daycare also with more complicated patients. But that patient, the situation was like that. My fellow then, and he was not so experienced at that time, uh, he uh, just approached the left main and you what you could see just as something like a stump of the left main and it, it's just about and it, it then they came the pattern came to my head oh no he he dissected you know and I was outside in the control room I, I washed and dressed and uh, but the patient did feel okay you know there was no problem so the left main was occluded but there was no problem. So uh, hmm. I calmed down again. Okay, it's a take care patient, just has an occluded left main, no problem. Let's try, let's see what's going on with the right. And as you can imagine, the right was uh, really a large vessel and really uh, going all the way to the left main, and all was depending on the right. And this guy was a, a wood chopper. So he had the only concern he had when he took his chainsaw, he was a little bit breathless lately. And when we saw the echo, the echo was like 20% ejection fraction. I personally thought this would be an ischemic problem. Uh, at this time at university, some people say, well, this is to just do this heart failure therapy. It's no need to open up the left main. You know, there are very many interesting viewpoints nowadays that some people believe in valsatans, acupitril, a lot more than in opening up left mains. And uh, we also, uh, this is also nice at the university, you have the surgeon right next by. You call the surgeon, they will be here in a minute. So we talked about it, but the surgeon would say, well, this guy has like 20% extraction fraction. I don't want to do the uh, this uh, if you have a way to do it interventionally, you do it. So we planned to do that, which was not easy because, easy because it was right in the middle of the COVID time. So we had almost no chance to have this. We had this a chance to have this daycare patient for two, three days in our hospital, <clears throat> but it was a weekend. And as they, uh, they started heart failure therapy, he was feeling better. And so on a Saturday, uh, one of the colleagues decided he is good now and the patient was feeling fine, so let him go home. And this is what he did. So with the occluded left main, with just depending on the right, and with good heart failure therapy, they sent him home. And I couldn't, I had, didn't have a chance to get him for a CTO PCI, which takes some time to, to get the slot for him. And he abandoned his therapy, <coughs> came back a month later, and then uh, we just did the case and we thought maybe we can do it anti so we don't need the impeller. Uh, but I, it, it was not possible. We could puncture through with the confianza, but this would not, it would not be possible to really get into the vessel distal of the left main. So then I decided to do this the other way around to really come from the right 
this was rather easy to do as long as you stayed away with the guide. So if you only went in with the microcatheter, because as soon as you approached with the guide, he would uh, pressure would drop and it would be, not be possible. But we actually did this case retrogradely. And uh, this, what I learned from this case also, uh, in a, again learned, I'd say, I'd say, when you then do the, try to do the connection, then you find out what is really depending on this retrograde was actually the circ and the diagonal much more than the LED pro it was not a problem. But the, the last meadow was the circ and this was a big, big circ. There was like a 3.54 millimeter circ and a large diagonal. So I did this case just in a way that I imperfectly co connected. I opened the left main, connected to the diagonal and to the circ and let the diagonal uh, that the LED as it was and it did not work on the LED that day but did it in a stage procedure later which was good because they had to do like almost two hours of work only on this LED even it was simple because it was now accessible but it was so calcified so it had it had allowed my wire to go through as a marker wire but not more than that mm -hmm. I'm just maybe this was an illustration how his work is going on so clearly you're doing you know very complex work and you build a wonderful program but how do you keep yourself fit and able to do all this do you exercise do you meditate what, what do you do Manos I did a great job on that uh, up to 3 years ago like for 10 years uh, you know I I'm living like 400 meters above Graz and like 15 kilometers away from the hospital so what I did, I had, did my, take my bicycle down in the morning, which was refreshing, and really went, went up with the bicycle in the afternoon. So I had one and a half hour of exercise on the bicycle every day for 10 years. <clears throat> then I wanted to have a new car. I tend to have a car and then uh, just use it at least it's useless until it's useless anymore. And then my wife said, well, but there's only 70,000 kilometers on this car because I had done 60,000 kilometers on the bicycle. <laughs> so then I stopped bicycling to get a new car. <laughs> <laughs> so right now I'm not doing anything. I'm uh, not, uh, uh, not trained. Uh, that, but this experience that back then was very good because uh, I, you would tend to tell the patient what to do. We tell the patient to do the workout, to change the lifestyle and stuff. I did not have to take uh, talk to the patient in that way at that time. They would find out the doctor is going up the hill every day and maybe I should too. Uh, so I didn't even talk about training. They would learn by the example. And right now I am in the situation that I'm not doing any training. How? What can I do, Manos? How can I change? <laughs> it's very simple. You just get your bike out and start again. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I should do that again. I even did it in the winter time. You know, did you ever do it on sp with spikes uh, in Minnesota? You have a lot. To we do, yes, yes, we do biking with spikes, yes. Yeah, you do. Yes, 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 yes. It's I mean, a lot of fun because going downhill on the spike, you know, it's a no problem as long as you stay on the bike. But once you uh, get, get off the bicycle, then you really slip. <laughs> Yeah, no, especially, you know, for us it's flat, so we don't have this uh, up and down, but I can imagine that can be very challenging. So you do do the train up? Uh, we do, do actually. I do, I do bike to work. I do bike to work or run to work. And in the winter, it's, it's snow, so yeah. Maybe this interview helps me to get onto that train again. Well, ne ne we'll do it again next year, see where the, pro the progress has been. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> I will be indebted to you for, the, for helping me do it again. <laughs> How about any favorite um, movies or any favorite books that you may have? Movies, I don't see many, not really. Uh, books, I do. I do have audiobooks, many audiobooks. I, like I would have always an audiobook ready, or maybe several of them. So if I have some waiting time or I'm driving the car or something, I would have it in the ear. I even on the bicycle, I even learned Italian by ear having this uh, just podcasts in my ear. And then I tended to read Italian books like Nic Niccolo Amaniti, the uh, Cella Festa Cominci or something like that. Uh, I tend to read books that uh, by authors who try to be as honest as they can, even if it's maybe then satirical or ironical, but they want to, they should be as honest as they, uh, just as they feel what the surroundings are, how they they see the world, how they see people. I want to learn more about relationships between people. 
be, and it's always fun to do this uh, in another language in another country because then it's maybe a little bit different than what the typical setting was. Maybe I have to say something I'm not asked. I think that the the main thing in my life, the main what shaped me a lot was uh, one year as an exchange student, very close to your area in uh, Des Moines, uh, in Grinnell, Iowa, actually in Grinnell, mm-hmm. Iowa where I could, uh, as an 18-year-old, just have this extra year, not even academic. It was just that I did high school again. It was for nothing, you know. It was absolutely useless, and it didn't <laughs> even uh, contribute to my retirement payments, as my then uh, teacher in school told me. But it was so important to to step out, to step out of the frame of the farm. You know, the farm is very, mm-hmm. uh, let's say, it's it's it putting pressure on you. The farm is hoping that you will be the farmer. But I wanted to have something like a new field. I wanted to get rid of the farm in a way. And this, even though I was on a farm in Iowa, you couldn't imagine, but it was close to Grinnell College, and it, I was participating in activities there also. So it made me find out what I really wanted. So this I wanted to tell also. This maybe this was a very uh, uh, much determining where I was gonna go. You never know. I guess every effort goes towards something, no matter what it is. But um, how about uh, the things that you've done? What are you most proud of, the things you've done so far? Well, it's not nothing to be proud of because I also always followed uh, my the voice, the inner voice. What I'm actually proud of, even though I can't help it, it's what was the work of my wife, was that my, my sons, my two sons do the same, not the same field, but they follow their inner voice. So the one is just a philosopher. He, he's, this is what he always liked most, he, to, to be able to read books. Both appreciate a lot that they can have university as a source for knowledge. As they say, they are very much aware that this is not a thing that is to, to be taken for granted. This is a privilege. And by having this attitude, uh, I think I have this attitude, and this is the only thing I could pass on to my kids, hopefully, some way. Not actively, but it was passed on the pioneer gene in a way. Like like the, the younger one, I took him to TCT San Francisco once and also down to Paul Dierstein to San Diego to make him go into medicine, like every father wants to infect his son. But at that time, he'd say, well, medicine, okay, I see the workflow, I see what they are doing, a little bit crazy. I much more like what is behind the curtains, you know, like TCT has a lot of IT going on. A lot. It was very impressive, even at that time in the Moscone Center. He was an Apple freak. He was his idea, ideal. His idol was Steve Jobs at that time. So this was actually the motive to follow, to come with his dad. He was like 18 at that time. And then he decided, no, medicine is not my thing, but IT, that would be great. You know, I'm proud of my sons. <laughs> And I'm proud of my wife, who is very strict in many things. Like she, she doesn't need anything. She says, like, if we, as I say, let's go on vacation to Maui, she'd say, why not go to Italy? It's also warm and nice, you know. <laughs> but then f- finally, she would say, oh, if you really want to go, and now she's enjoying it. And the whole thing is built around a meeting where we will meet again uh, with Bill Lombardi in uh, Seattle. So the first time I was in Seattle was actually also with my wife when she was pregnant when I was 26. I had bought a car uh, for $500 in Maine. Mm. And then we drove all over the continent and down the I-1 and uh, back to Denver. But we also went to Seattle just for one reason. I, I, she didn't even go. She stayed at Longview, south of Seattle, uh, because we had friends there. Uh, friends that were not hadn't been friends before, but we just had uh, pushed the button and say, "Here we are, the friends of the friends, and can we stay for a while and stuff?" So they became our friends. And I would drive up to Seattle because there were the most famous paramedics in the world at that time, and I wanted at that time to improve paramedic system in Graz. So at least I got their protocol, and we're still using it in Graz. Just a glimpse of my life. It's always like that. So it's amazing that, you know, you've taken you so many places, right? You were in Iowa, then you were in all the U.S. What were you doing in the in the U.S. Uh, at 26? Was it just vacation or were you training? or? 
No, this was absolutely useless again. It was just fun with my wife. I was, we came over on the very cheap flight with Tarom. It was a Romanian airline. Like we had the seat in the back where there was a lot of smoke. I, you remember when they still smoked on the, no, you're too young. You don't remember. Too young. <laughs> <laughs> but we had smoke and for, for food, we had like bacon and really stuff, stuff, you know, this was the cheap flight to New York. Then I tried to to get a, a car in New York for uh, $500 because the Greyhound bus would have been too expensive for the whole summer. We had the <laughs> whole summer and we were, would like, she was also an exchange, had been an exchange student in Illinois, actually. So we visited both families, both host families, and we got this list of people. Uh, they went well, you know, they said, oh, if you're going there, maybe they will help you and so and we had this list of people just with it was just vacation it was just fun just to no program nothing uh, but it was impressive and i remember every single day and I, I i really have to say even more than in the year when i was an exchange student at that time i was maybe more uh, involved in what i what i was wanting and stuff but at that and on that tour i really appreciated a lot american hospitality you know, you really can't go there, push the button, say, I'm the friend of the friend. We've never seen you. Can't I stay with <laughs> you? And we would have a nice talk. We had have dinner together. We'd have breakfast together. We might stay another day even. And it, it, this is something I don't think it would be like that in Austria. Well, again, that's also, I guess, thanks to you that you've been doing all these things that, you know, you present yourself in a friendly and nice way, but, but you're right, people are very open. And what are the exciting things? It looks like every, every year, every few years, you have a new thing that ca ca captures your imagination and your will and you're moving on and you're learning and doing things. So what is the next thing for you? What is the next thing on your list? Yeah, well, I try to cope with artificial intelligence. I haven't used ChatGPT so far, but my fellows do. So I have to find out what is written by them and what, what <laughs> ChatGPT is writing. But they tell me. They, they are very open. So, uh, you know, I remember the time when we had a telephone booth and now we have this smartphone. I was uh, joking at that time, maybe kids will be born with a screen on their forehead so that we just touch a little <laughs> bit here or something like maybe we have chips implanted. I don't know. I expect... Uh, Maybe that we will be useless as interventional cardiologists, just like the gastric surgeons had been useless from one day to the other when the PPIs came up. I'm ready to for that time because then maybe the next project then would be to get the board and le learn how to surf. <laughs> or maybe uh, what I have missed out so far, I'm not actively playing any instrument except for the flute. I would maybe want to do some uh, work, uh, learn music, you know. So maybe it will be something completely different. And I'm a little bit puzzled by Bill, uh, Bill Lombardi, as he's talking about retirement right now, which I can hardly believe uh, for that guy. And I'm very interested to join them uh, in the next, in the session just uh, in a week a week later or so in the week to come, and <laughs> uh, because I am sixty two now and I cannot really think about retirement. I, I I don't know, you know, maybe I had a little bit of trouble with the with the eye lately when I, on the flight from Tokyo to Vienna I had this strange point uh, come jumping around and then I had to be lasered in Graz. But uh, this reminds me that I will not be there forever. But I can see, all right, now it's it. They did a great job. Uh, so uh, sometimes I, I remember uh, something reminds me that this will not be forever. But as soon as long as it's going on, I try to get more into education. Maybe uh, I, I, I also try to get more into. Uh, t contact with R and D of the companies uh, again because I had been with them in my early early days. It was a lot better uh, this bridge, and then it was not was unpopular for a doctor to be in touch with a company. It was almost to be sh like a shameful thing to be in touch with industry, which I think is crazy because. Uh, I mean, they suffer just as much as we do. Like if people develop something, invent something, build something, get uh, permission that it is used in the cath lab, it takes like five years, 10 years. So, uh, and then we use it and we say, why didn't they do it differently? 
So, so I see a need that there is a, a, a bridge also. I, I'm, I hope I'm able to build bridges and a big bridge to R&D to build that together again uh, is one of my projects. Yeah. So you have lots of things, lots of things I had. But if you had to summarize, so any few key points for the people who are starting now, the fellows or any career interventionists who want to follow your pathway, become good at complexity or PCI, what would be your top recommendations? I'd say do only things that you are interested in and what you really like that might still imply that it's not easy. But if you if you want to find out, go ahead, approach people who think you they know, get away from your hospital, try to build your own style by exposing yourself to different people. Like uh, it's great, Manos. I'm, I'm so happy that you have, have me uh, on the boat with these uh, very special books you uh, are writing. That uh, just by uh, being allowed to review them a little bit and go through them. Uh, it it opened up my mind so much. It uh, got it helped me also find the people that know better. So for the youngs youngsters, do not be afraid. Approach people. Write an email. Uh, ask questions. Be serious. Be honest. Don't do it for fake. Don't do it for just to show. But if it's really, if you really want to find out, you can find out on this globe. You can you can get there. So it's there is no barrier that you cannot overcome if you want to do that. This is maybe the message. Well, Stephanie, yeah, this was wonderful. I don't want to abuse your kindness too much. It's time to go to the beach now. It looks like the birds are out there and the Absolutely. sun is coming out. But thank you so much. It's been, again, such a great pleasure talking to you today. Thanks for all the great insights. Look forward to seeing you next week in Seattle. Thank you, Manos. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Sensei Podcast. 